Welcome everyone to episode 60. I don't know what 60 is in anniversary. Uh, is it Ruby? Is it Ruby or something? We should buy each other things for these <laughs> milestones, Greg. Yeah. But yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Massive thank you in advance to doctors uh, Cynthia Formosa and Alfred Gatt from Malta. Um, we're going to just have a bit of a loose episode here where we talk about Malta. We talk about podiatry in Malta, podiatry in Europe, and we just see uh, and all the research that these guys have done, and we just see where the discussion takes us so anything you want to ask um if you're if you're watching on facebook uh, as we go along just drop it in the comments and craig will craig will pick it up i often start by uh, doing a little bit of research about our guests um or, you know the day in the days leading up to this and then sort of bunch together a bit of a summary but these two have just been have just been too successful and they've just had too much going on we've got fellowships at staffordshire university here in the uk we've got presidencies of, of uh, European sort of higher education podiatry things. So I just, if, if, if I may, might just ask you to, to talk about yourselves for a bit and just introduce yourselves to, to our audience, um, a bit about you um, and, and your background, if that's okay. If we, if we start with you simply, if that's okay. Yes, so um, currently I am the head of the podiatry department at the University of Malta. Uh, here we have a number of courses, starting from bachelor courses, we offer master courses, and also um, PhDs. Um, besides that, uh, as you have said, uh, we dedicate a lot of time to research. Um, me, myself, my speciality is diabetes, the diabetic foot, um, diabetes education, amongst others. So basically, that is it about us, you know. Um, we, we, we try to, as much as possible, promote podiatry and obviously try um, to, 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 to make the profession grow as much as possible. Awesome. Um, and Alfred? Well, I'm, I qualified in one of the first podiatry courses in Malta. If I may dare say so, 33 years ago. That's a long, long time ago. So, uh, spent over 20 years in, in public health, you know, um, I was managing the podiatry services in Malta. And then about 10 years ago, decided that academia was for me. You know, I had too, too much stress on the job, if I may say so. Um, yeah, we do a lot of, um, as, as uh, Cynthia was saying, we do um, a lot of courses. Um, we stick to the British model of, of podiatry here. Um, I am... You know, I, I supervise quite a lot of masters and PhD uh, students. I'm also president of MPODE, which is the European Network of Podiatry in, 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 in higher education, actually. That's the, 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 and, and our members are actually um, universities from all over Europe. We've got about 27 universities at the moment. You know, Malta, Belgium, the UK, um, Holland, France. Um, hopefully Italy soon. So we're trying to, you know, put podiatry on a par because there's a lot of problems with podiatry, as you know, um, all over Europe. It's the uh, different models that are employed and all that. So we are keeping ourselves quite busy, you know. <laughs> actually, actually, Alfred, you, you said that you, you left the public sector to, to come to academia because of the stress levels. Um, how are the stress levels now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So how how's the stress levels now? <laughs> well, they're always high, but <laughs> at, least, <laughs> at least I'm enjoying it. To be honest, at least I'm enjoying. We love doing research. We love teaching. You know, we love young young people who come in our in our courses. You know, it makes you feel young as well. You know, dealing with twenty year olds and then the more mature students, thirty year olds or or, or a bit older. You know. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's so, so look, actually, just before we go on, for those that have just joined, I'd, let me let me just point out where Malta is. Um, <laughs> I, I've, shame on you, shame I've, on you if you don't know this already. Yeah, I'm I've, sure. I, I have, as Cynthia and Alfred know, I have visited, um, but here's my Google map zooming in, um, Italy, and the, there it is, there <laughs> for those that, that don't know where, where it is. Um, let me stop the share. So, tiny island, south of Sicily. Um, we are officially, we officially have a population of half a million now. We've seen a, about a 25% increase in the population in the past five or 10 years or so. So, 
we're growing. We're such a small island, but we're growing, you know. Mm. Uh, a lot of British influence. Um, English is actually one of our official languages. So we, in Malta, we speak Maltese and English. And we also speak Italian, but, uh, you know, but that's not in the sort of constitution. Mm. So, yeah, there are a lot of uh, British ties here. Um, you know, Malta was a British base for about 200 years, I think. So... Perfect. We, we had a few questions come in about about uh, podiatry in Malta. So a bit about sort of, yeah. um, you yeah. know, how many how many students there are, how many podiatrists there are and, and are people in private, you know, the private sector research and, and, and several questions like that. I think, uh, you know, as we were talking before off air, you said you had a, a bit of a presentation. It seems like you probably get this, uh, this you get the opportunity to talk about this a lot. Is uh, what do you think, Craig? Should we? Should we well, go should to we, the presentation? We'll go to the first, presentation. We, we can interrupt with questions or something like that. If that's okay. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Should I share? Share, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, that's our university. Okay. Um, it's about uh, 12,000, 15,000 students. Um, our course is a four-year course. It's a, a sort of traditional uk type of course um it's actually the only course in europe which is accredited by the royal college of surgeons and physicians of glasgow and you know we've worked um, a lot in that respect to, to 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 make this happen because we believe that having the same body that accredits medical um, other medical professions you know would, would be a benefit to us uh well our website and well, this is one of our clinics. Um, our, our faculty is actually based inside the main hospital. Um, we have one big hospital. It's, a, it, 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 it's quite a new hospital now, quite busy, uh, which is situated exactly next to the university. So it makes it easy for us to, um, to work from there. Um, this is our biomechanics lab, where I'm presently at the moment. Um, I know that perhaps Cynthia can butt in because I mean she's she's responsible for for all this stuff, you know, and she she does a hell of a good job for it, you know, of coordinating all these. Yes, um, as I said, before, courses that we have. We offer courses um, with regards to our undergraduate program. Um, usually, we have an intake of about fifteen students a year. Um, obviously, we try to keep the number as small as possible, as we are saying before, it's because of the size of the island, in order to find patients for our students, we need to be very careful, we cannot cater for an, a lot of a number of students. Um, besides that, uh, we, open all, we have also master courses and PhDs, these are also open to international students, especially students who are in the EU, they can come to Volta and study for free. Um, uh, as part of the, the, the European Union. We also offer some CPT courses, mainly in uh, vascular uh, assessment of the diabetic foot and also in um, clinical education. So basically those are the courses which we offer every year. Um, as I said, attendance is quite good, so we are, we are happy. Um, this is what we are seeing now is basically all Malta with Covino and Gozo. So for those of you who would like to come and study here in Malta, this is our island. So we, we have a lot of sun, unlike what uh, Ian was saying, where it's raining here, it is nearly 40 degrees today. So the weather is amazing. <laughs> so, You're breaking yes. my heart. You're breaking my heart. <laughs> you should come over, Ian. <laughs> So basically, that, that, is, that is us at, at university. Uh, besides that, obviously, we have also Erasmus placements. We have a lot of agreements with the universities, both in the UK, Spain, Belgium, and both um, uh, senior lecturers come over uh, to share their experiences with us. Students are always welcome to come and spend a couple of weeks or months with us. Um, and obviously, um, basically, that 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 is what that, that is what we offer. Actually, Cynthia and Alfred, can I just just ask how, how many students do you have in each year group? About as I said, we try not to take more than fifteen students a year. Because 
can I just say from, from the outside looking in, given the size of Malta, given the size of the department, you're punching well above your weight in what you're achieving, which is really quite remarkable <laughs> for, the, for the small size. And, and how do you manage to do that? <laughs> well, we have to work hard. <laughs> but we are happy, as you said. We love our work. And we are committed to our work. So I think that's, that's the, 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 the secret to it all. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think we get 50 per year in the UK. Um, am I right? Are you the only university offering a podiatry yeah, undergrad yes. and postgrad? So every all. year, every year, the entire, there's around 50 new graduates um, yes. Per, yes. per year. And, and they, they all stay in Malta. There's enough work for all of them or they, they travel around Europe or they, they go into you know, postgrad study. What, what, what are the sort of splits there? Well, it's a, it's a mixture, I would say. Yes, most of them till now stay in Malta. I mean, till now, you know, there are there are still job opportunities because, as I said, podiatry is growing. People are becoming more, more aware of the profession. Um, so, yes, till now, most of them stay stay in Malta. Um, obviously, most of them are also studying at postgraduate level. Today, I think students have are realizing that it's very important to, to, to study at postgraduate level. Obviously, some um, decide to go and study mostly in the UK. But as I said, I mean, from, from uh, the very um, recently, uh, although some of the Maltese students do go and study in the UK, but now we are also seeing people from Europe coming to study at our university. So at the moment, we have people from Greece who are interested to start a PhD with us. Um, we have uh, people from, the, who, from Belgium who have asked to start a master's degree with with us so you know i think we are now we are also becoming also um, um internationally well known too so we are seeing a lot of students even from europe yeah that doesn't surprise me if i'm honest i look at this beautiful island in front of me here i, I hear the, the i hear that it's 40 degrees and you see what just an amazing setup you guys have got and i think to myself wow like 20 years ago you, i'd have been straight over there in the summer holidays for a placement no messing the most amazing thing, if I may say so, is that the undergrad programs are free. Yeah. So wow. our, our students don't pay anything. And because, um, and it's because of the EU, anyone in the EU who would like to come and study in Malta will also, will also uh, study for free. Yeah. You know, so, um, uh, they actually get a stipend. Our students actually get paid to 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 during their courses so um so besides uh, all our students do their training actually at the at the nhs you know at the at the hospitals and the health centers old people's homes and uh, mental hospital so um how do we do it is because we have a lot of um supervisors who work very hard so they are not full-time um, they are not full-time lecturers they will be visiting lecturers and, and and mentors so they supervise um our students more or less almost on a one-to-one -one basis um and they do a great job at um at that besides podiatry we also um i, I also coordinate a, a master's in clinical biomechanics which is open to podiatrists physiotherapists you know engineers physicians we've had physicians and physiotherapists as students uh, i like to say we've got a very well equipped lab here so um we we enjoy this program very much and we we, we also do uh, masters by research which means that most of the uh, students can actually not stay at home but you know they can do their research in their country if they come from a foreign country for example um, and did, did, sorry, did I hear correctly, Alfred, that anyone in the EU gets their postgraduate study for free uh, as well? Did I, did I hear that? Not the postgraduate, just the undergrad, okay. The postgraduate yes. fees are really very, very low, huh? Yeah. So I think very, like a, very... a master's degree will cost about 400 euros a year. 400 euros a year? Yeah, for wow. a master's. I mean, I'm thinking about I'm thinking about the eleven thousand pounds that mine cost me, yeah. and I'm thinking I'm thinking if there's 
yeah. people sit, sitting here contemplating biomechanics or whatever masters um and they're uk based this is this is this is hopefully something they might might consider and they don't necessarily need to what you're saying is for the MRES, they wouldn't have to move to Malta either. Although I don't know why they wouldn't want to, but you, you know what I mean. <laughs> but if do if they do want to work in our lab, I mean, in our lab we've got well, an 18 camera Vicon, we've got two empty force plates, we've got a CAT CAM system, 3D printers, inch foot pressure, EMG, uh, thermal cameras. So you know we're quite well equipped, if I may, if I may say wow. so. So. <laughs> So, wow. Yeah, we have interesting, interesting. Um, we're still having interesting, um, um, you know, uh, projects going on, which we, we even publish most of them. You know, like you know, gate changes in pregnancy. Um, um, we study materials for offloading the foot. Um, we're looking at, for example, what's known as an oxetic materials, which are a new breed of materials which behave differently to the normal paddings that we normally use you know um we 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 studied you know just just uh, two weeks ago we just published a paper in gait and posture about uh, the effect of peripheral tail disease on muscle activity we, we had a lot of emg usage in that so you know our students you know we try to make them do um you know to motivate them to do um, projects which have a meaning you know not just a little bit of a project just to say that they did a project if you know what i mean yeah that's perfect did you was there any more slides you wanted to share i only say that because looking at this map i'm just um, getting so so insanely jealous I need, I, I I need this. On the... <laughs> that's better i need that i need that beautiful island out of my out of my eye shot <laughs> <laughs> like craig i did a um a little bit of a but uh, this is the motivation for most of our research. You know, although in Malta you can hardly see it on the map, we have a very high prevalence of diabetes. Oh, yeah. um, so it's, at the moment it's about 10 to 15 percent of the population with diabetes. But according to IDF, by 2040 there will be a staggering 45 percent of the population which has diabetes. But why? Why is so, that? Why you is know, that so? Why is that so high? What's you? That, yeah. that, that is quite high for the for the. What's the nature of the population that would make it that high? Yeah, we believe that it is a genetic a genetic predisposition. Yeah. Because you're not, you're not you're not overrun with McDonald's or anything like that, are you? <laughs> no, no, no. Oh. It's it's genetic. It's genetic. It's genetic. It's genetic. Exercise and and obesity on the increase, but most of the time, I think it is a genetic problem, um, which I believe comes from. Um, and I think Cynthia can talk more about it than me. From the time of the war, when people were starved, you know, and then any scrap of food they could get, uh, because we were the most heavily bombed country in World War Two as well, you know. So you know basically the, the 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 body developed this this type of uh thrifty genotype thing that that uh stores whatever food you you you, you eat so and predisposes us to obesity and all that stuff and then there is this it's another motivation you know the amount of amputations that are done um, now the hospitals are very glad because as you can see the, the major amputations are going down you know but unfortunately minor amputations are shooting up and for us major amputations uh, uh, sorry minor amputations we also think that it is a very 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 big problem for for our for our patients um, so Cynthia and I we started doing you know, concentrating a lot of our works on diabetes. You know? So maybe Cynthia can say. Yeah, um, we started basically by, uh, I mean, uh, this, this uh, paper takes us back to 2012. So as you see, we've been now about six, seven years um, uh, researching on diabetes, the diabetic foot in Malta. 
I mean, this was one of my first postdoctoral studies right after I got my PhD in 2009. And uh, as Alfred is saying, I mean, we started to realize um, uh, local, local research was very, very scarce at the moment. There was no research at all with regards to Malta. And, and obviously we started to see the severity of this problem, you know, especially with regards to diabetic, diabetic food disease. Um, as I said, and we started um, uh, conducting a number of, of studies. I mean, we, we, we wanted to see um, how the way that the people with diabetes actually do walk, biomechanical assessment, vascular assessment, neurological assessment. We, we were interested, we were interested like, you know, in, in, in all aspects of diabetes with regards to the diabetic foot. And uh, some of our results, in fact, were quite, quite shocking. You know, I mean, and obviously it kept showing us the importance of conducting more research in this field in order, in order to try to help um, this, this population and most importantly, to save limb and lives. Because I think after all, that is the main role of a podiatrist. Mm. You know, we are here to save limbs and obviously ultimately save lives. Because we do know that when patients have amputations, I mean, if you talk to our vascular surgeons, and they all say that people usually die, especially after major amputations, within a couple of years. You know, so so I think that the role of the podiatrist should really be to, to save limbs in order to save lives. I don't know if Alfred could go through a couple of papers more, which would be... Yeah, 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 for example, conducted. in this paper, you know, um, we really had some some quite revealing results for example we in this sample population like half of them with hallux valgus 39 percent of them with hammer toes you know 24 percent of our prominent metatarsal heads um you know uh, about 56 percent presented with unsuitable footwear so you know we were realizing the scope of the uh, the extent of of the problem in malta um Actually, can I, can I just ask, guys, the, just going back to the previous um, paper, the one on the prevalence of, the prevalence of, um, yeah, the, the one before that, uh, where you look, looked at the, the prevalence of, of, yeah, this one here, the, the, like the, the, looking at regional variations in risk factors and regional variation and complications is a, is a valuable resource to try and get to the bottom of it. Just on that, did you no, any, notice anything different with the Malta population compared to other populations? Well, first of all, um, there are there are a lot of um, differences. Yes, because we we technically talk about UK and USA populations. Yeah, um, uh, we are we are really um, a Mediterranean. European, also Semitic kind of mixture, yeah. you know, and so there are there are a lot of uh, differences in the way we think, in the way we we live our life, in the hot climate by itself, for example, you know, um, like footwear, you know, um, footwear. All a lot of our patients use unsuitable footwear in in summer. Just because it is so hot to to um, to walk in a thirty five degree you know so, uh, temperature so 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 um, yeah, yeah we this thing really started us off also on thinking about how to develop our own um, guidelines for diabetic foot screening and that well that is another story that is that is coming uh, quite soon you know uh, because we also did Cynthia has led also um, uh, quite a lot of uh, work on diabetic foot screening and we firmly believe that you know with screening um, there are a lot of problems cons you know with, with diabetic foot screening that need to be solved especially in a country like ours yeah well that makes, that makes so, sense yeah hope Fully. <laughs> so go, go back to the slide then, you're on here. Yeah, sorry to interrupt there. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Go back to this one. Yeah, that, that's a good that's a good topic. 
<laughs> yes, that's a very hot topic. Yeah. Yes. We firmly believe that screening should be done by properly trained people. Um, and just looking at a, you know, at someone's pulse, you know, just palpating someone's pulse um, is not a way to screen for, for uh, diabetic foot disease. You know, we think that whoever does the examinations and the screening should be properly trained. And basically, we think it, most of the time it should be a podiatrist. <laughs> I may be a bit mm. <laughs> biased in that. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the, 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 the issue here is that, if, as we'll see later on, that we talk about, about vascular okay, um, examinations. If I detect, if I cannot palpate someone's pulse, it's already too late. And we don't want to detect those, those people who, are, who have critical limb ischemia. We don't want to detect those people. We want a, the screening process to detect um, those patients who are starting to have a, a foot problem so that they can be properly uh, treated um, by, by the, the professionals, you know? So if I detect them at a stage where it is still too late, okay, it's good for them, obviously. They need to be detected, surely. But we need to do more, um, uh, more in-depth analysis when we are screening for, for vascular, for example, for uh, vascular perfusion. And that was when this next slide starts coming in. Maybe Cynthia can can talk about this, so I don't want to take over. <laughs> Cynthia. Well, basically what we did, maybe there's another pr um, paper before, um, after this. Basically what we wanted to do, we, we, we did like a, a big review with regards to, to um, uh, screening guidelines, which are used basically around the world. I mean, we looked at big guidelines like the Australian guidelines, IDF, NICE, uh, Scottish guidelines, and if one had to read um, these guidelines, one would actually see that this, this is the paper I am talking about. Um, this is quite a big paper. Um, the, the, the guidelines do not agree. So while some guidelines tell you that as Alfred is saying, palpation of pulses is enough with regards to vascular assessment, there obviously are then other guidelines which say, no, you need to do an ABPI or you need to do toe pressures or, you know, and obviously this creates confusion. I mean, if you are a clinician and you want to start some protocol with regards to foot screen, diabetic foot screening, and you start uh, reading different guidelines, which different guidelines say different things, obviously it's going to be quite confusing to the reader. Furthermore, even if you had to look at the evidence behind uh, what these guidelines are proposing, again, even the, guide, the, the evidence um, it does, not, does not agree. So basically, we, we, we wrote this paper and we critically evaluated these guidelines and obviously the recommendations from this paper is that obviously one needs to be very cautious um, with regards to both when you are trying to adopt food screening guidelines and even when we are actually screening in our clinics because um, we, we've conducted ourselves research um, like uh, maybe we could see the paper on, on vascular assessment. We basically he used about all the six available tools which one could use um, and this one was, was with regards to neuropathy also but with regards to this vascular one if you can see we, we, we took a number of patients and we tested their, their peripheral arterial disease using pulse palpation, Doppler waveform analysis, ADPIs, uh, toe pressures, statistical tools and if you see if one looks at the graph you see that same patient you know using okay different tools gives actually different um, answers so if maybe you are uh, using pulse palpation you do not feel the pulse but and then if you are using a doppler waveform obviously you can feel um you can see you can you can you can feel the pulse so obviously here we've, we've asked for caution with regards to, to clinicians 
to which stools they should be using when they are screening um, with regards to peripheral arterial disease. And as I said, we also conducted this study even for peripheral neuropathy, and we found the same, the, the same, the same results. So obviously our advice is to all podiatrists, clinicians, anyone who is doing any screening uh, methods and screening tests, not to rely only on one um, screening method. But obviously, if, if, if you are screening for peripheral artery disease, um, you should obviously maybe start with pulse palpation, then move to Doppler waveform analysis. And then maybe if results are not, um, they do not concur, obviously we, we think that the, at, at present, the gold standard is the TBPIs, the toe brachial pressure indices, because we know that especially in diabetic patients and in patients who smoke, the arteries in the toes tend to become less calcified than the arteries in the legs. So that is why uh, today, I, um, even if you read current literature, um, everyone is moving towards more toe pressures than towards ankle brachial pressure index because we know that with ankle brachial pressure index, we could have um, falsely elevated um, results in this population. Yeah. Actually, Cynthia, we just had a question. So, sorry, Cynthia, we just had a question about the guidelines. Oh, well, first there was a comment, someone, uh, Veronica just commented that she's so glad that you actually raised the topic of guidelines. I know it's, there's been quite a lot of discussion on that in recent years about the differences. Veronica has also asked a question about well, which, which guideline would you or guidelines would you recommend? To, to be honest, as I said, I mean, if you read my paper, yeah. I, I am in no position to recommend any guide, which, which yeah. is the best one, you yeah. know? I mean, I don't think that would be fair. Huh. But um, I think one positive thing that we have seen, and I believe that our paper, to be honest, did raise the alarm so i do believe that our paper did raise the alarm and um, we we did notice that um even um, these these guidelines are all now um, they were all re revised they have introduced may following even maybe our papers the use of doppler waveform analysis because if you look at previous guidelines up to about four or five years ago there was never no mention of doppler waveform analysis as i said everyone used to say Pulse palpation, ABPIs. Okay. Today, even these 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 big guidelines, okay, um, are realizing that ABPIs are no longer reliable because, as I said, because of the calcification of arteries, and and we have to move to other tools. And as I said, even if, even with regards to tools, um, we do not, as I said, recommend that a clinician should rely on one tool you should at least use one or two tests. And when results do not concur, then obviously move to other tests and if need be, even refer for duplex scanning, if obviously the results are, are extremely um, bad. You know, if I, if I have an extremely high risk patient. Yeah. But just on the on the this issue of the reliability of the ABI or the ABPI, my understanding is that it is actually reasonably or acceptably reliable, but unhealthy people. But but yeah, but the, it, it, the it's just that the, some of the figures because of the calcification could be false. So yeah. it, it it might be there might be quite repeatable in those people, but it might be quite repeatable of a, of a falsely elevated value. Is, is exactly. that correct? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, but the, the thing is, is this, uh, Craig, we, we, a few years ago, we tended to believe that anyone who has a calcified arteries will have an ABPI above 1.3. Yeah. But it is really not the case. And we were, we were look, looking at this when we were looking at using various different techniques. So you can have someone who, for example, without any calcification would have an ABI of 0.6. But because of the calcification, that would be artificially raised to one, you yeah. know? And, and the problem is sometimes, like in the UK, you have, um, there's this tendency for um, foot care assistants to do ABIs themselves or for other non-clinicians to do ABIs. And for me, you know, just having an ABI of one means perfect. 
But then, with a, if you look at the clinical picture, if you look at how the foot presents itself, you know, if you look at the pallor, the cyanosis, uh, lack of of um, lack of hair on, uh, and all that stuff, unless that person is trained very well, and they will not notice the, that, that that ABI of one is not really normal, but an elevated ABI of someone who should have a, a lesser. So we really think that, you know, we should look for, and we still don't know the ideal, although we have, we've published a paper at the integrated re reliability of, of waveform analysis, we found that it has a huge, um, and we firmly believe that waveform analysis is, 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 a, is a good modality, but we still have not had the chance to, to, to compare that to a gold standard. Yeah. What, a, what about the toe pressure index? Is, is that yeah. a useful replacement for it? Or? Yeah. Toe pressure index. Yeah. yeah. We also believe that the toe pressure index, technically speaking, is, should be a valuable, valuable um, um, test because, well, anyway, that's what everyone says because of the reduced chance of calcification and all that stuff. Sometimes it's very difficult to, use, to, to use it and not a lot of people are trained to use it. Mm. I, would, I would really, sh should really spend more time um, training for that it's looking at toe pressures than ankle pressures. Okay. Also, one other thing, when you take an ankle pressure, if you're taking the pressure of the ankle, it has nothing to do with the foot. No, actually, that's good. So I, hope, I hope a lot of people realize this. You're measuring pressure at the ankle and not at the foot. So that's another, you know, for ABI from, from my end. Yeah, well, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, where were we? <laughs> yeah, well, where were we? Okay, some more projects. <laughs> we, we, we have so many, so many research going on, you know, we're so, so keen on, on finding new things. Sure. So basically then uh, we, had, we had established what, uh, what we call the uh, Diabetes Foot Research Group at the university. And we got this project together to look at term, uh, thermography. And we were looking looking at possibly applying thermography as a means of detecting um, uh, diabetic foot disease. So we, we started off with looking at healthy people, okay, because you need to know the baseline, which is a healthy person. Um, and then we compared the thermal um, signatures, the thermal patterns of these uh, healthy people to people living with peripheral arterial disease to people living with uh, neuropathy and neuroschemia. So we have, you know, these four categories of people. Um, and basically <laughs> we were quite shocked when our um, results in, in, in patients with peripheral arterial disease under, under controlled climatic conditions, may I say so, so all the all the the lab was at 23 degrees Celsius. That they exhibited a higher foot temperature than than the normals, mm. and it took us quite some time to try to understand it. Even our vascular surgeon couldn't, you know, um, couldn't understand it un until we started talk, talk, thinking about you know collateral circulation, and which is which is more superficial. But we um, actually. Um, confirmed this in two different studies which were published in, in, in two different um, journals and then we compared all of them and at this stage we feel that we are at a position where we can actually identify whether a person this is all theoretical okay at the moment so don't tell me but we we are beginning to to start a couple of studies on this, that we can actually come identify whether a person living with diabetes has diabetic foot disease or not by, by taking a thermal image, which is, I, for me, I think would be really an, an, an advancement, you know, um, especially as a screening tool. And, that, and that's So basically looking at the temperature 
we are. Yes, sir. So I was going to ask Alfred that thermal image could be done through our smartphones. Yes. Well, that is one of the, you know, because, well, the first study we did, we used a camera that cost 60,000 euros. Mm. So second one was a bit less, about 30,000. Now we are going, we are comparing different cameras, including tiny, tiny uh, thermal cameras mm. um, that attach to the smartphone. Mm. There are even smartphones with built-in thermal cameras nowadays. Nowadays. So we firmly believe that the, the higher the temperature, the more the probability um, that that person has diabetic foot disease of peripheral arterial disease, neuropathy or neuroschemia um, increases with the temperature, you know? Unfortunately, at the moment, we cannot discriminate one from the other. But, I, but we feel that if we can just say, out of 100 people, hey, you three, you, you might have this from a simple photo. I think it would be, you know, quite, uh, quite an achievement. So hopefully within a couple of years time, we'll have the results on that. That's just to give you an example of toe temperature distribution. As you can see, the first two columns are the diabetes healthy and the healthy adults. Okay. While the other three columns are for neuropathy, PAD, and neuroschemia. And you can see the significantly higher temperatures between the healthy and the, um, and the uh, diabetic foot complication group. There. Oh, you know it's... So the same thing in the forefoot, it's in the toes and in the forefoot. Um, I, for all those who are interested, we published this in the, I think it was the International Journal of Endocrinology, of endocrinology, yeah, a couple of years ago. Yeah, that was, this is our regression analysis, you see? So if you look at the dark, um, at the dark figure, which is slowly going up, it's, so this is temperature versus probability, you know? There comes a point, an intersection, where above that temperature, um, the, higher, the higher the temperature goes, the, the increased probability of having foot disease. And the lower the temperature goes, the, high, the, the, the higher the probability that you are normal, actually, that there is no disease. So we're very, very keen on this. And we, we really do believe ah, this, this in, in, in thermography. We also used it to look at um, ulceration in diabetic foot disease because, you know, it can give us, if you look at this thermal image, you can see the ulcer, you know. And you can see the level of activity around the ulcer, whatever it is, whatever it is, it's inflammatory reaction, um, whatever is going on, it, it gives us a second eye. And well, we said then maybe, I mean, look at this one. In this, in this patient, he had an apical ulcer on the second toe, yet the third toe is quite as hot as the second toe. And actually this person developed an ulcer in that other their toe as well after a couple of months. You know, looking, looking at a thermal image, I'm, I, I'm sure anyone can see that there's something wrong with this foot, right? So if you look at the first MP joint region on the, the, on the right side of the, of the screen, right? It is significantly hotter. Can you see that? Can you see mm. the area where it is so hot? It's actually eight degrees hotter than the than the other other area, well, and and what's causing it? Well, that's an ulcer. Well, actually, Alfred, was it an ulcer, or was it an ulcer about to happen? No, no, this is an ulcer. It was an ulcer, an this active is, ulcer. Yeah, this is a neuropathic ulcer. But, but you clever because this is the second one. Okay, same features. This is an ulcer about to happen. Yeah. So it's an area of hyperkeratosis with, uh, with underlying um, bleeding there. It's not actually, it's not actually um, ulcerated yet. So, you know, you can see that the possibility of, of um, using thermography to detect impending, impending ulcers. Yeah. 
And I think, Alfred, you know, you know my views from, from Italy about the conference about the, the potential to intervene to halt that process before the ulcer happens. That's the most exciting thing about this. Exactly. We, we just exactly. don't know what that intervention should be and if it actually does work or not. But that's, that's on the horizon and, and that's exciting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. One step at a time. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Hello. Have you got any more there? Any more slides, Alfred? Yeah. Right. I can go forever, but yeah. I think that should be. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you yeah, know, we're, 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 uh, we're, the, hour's, the hour's almost up. It's gone quickly. Yeah. I should do, uh, let me let me just say. I know Craig mentioned uh, a while ago, very compliment in a in a very complimentary fashion that you guys were you used the phrase "punching above your weight" with regards to just how well organised and you were getting good student numbers in but it's also worth saying that your research output uh, is just it's just massive um don't you, don't you think craig i mean I, i'm i'm just trying to think of um that, that was my uh, comment mean, about that was my comment about his stress levels yeah yeah i mean <laughs> got, no, we actually enjoy doing it so. <laughs> it's serious it's serious seriously impressive i mean it's pretty clear to me that anyone listening who who, uh, who's thinking, I like hot weather, I want to do a master's, uh, I, I don't like the idea of how expensive master's in the UK are, and I've got an interest in diabetes or, or PVD. I mean, I just don't know what, I'd expect an email from them by 10 o'clock tonight. I just can't see why they wouldn't want to get in touch with you about this stuff. <laughs> they are more than welcome. <laughs> Craig, do we have anything that's come through? No, we've, we've had quite a few comments, a, a couple of questions that sort of been addressed. So do you just want to do the stop stop share, Alfred, just so we can all come back on the, the okay, believe it or not, so the hour's almost well, up. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. Oh, wow. No. Yeah. No, I think I'm just, I'm just scrolling back. Yeah, there, there, there's, there were, there's, there's been some comments, um, not really any questions. There's a couple of questions there that have been addressed, but if you too, if you've got time later on, can just come back and respond to a couple of the comments would be good. Sure. They're there for everyone to speak. The other, thing I'd the other thing I'd probably say to anyone who isn't watching this live on Facebook right now, Thursday evening, but it is, is currently in the gym or on the way to the car and they're listening to this as, as a podcast. I know many people prefer that, that vehicle. Um, you're not going to get as much from this particular episode if you don't if you don't see some of the screenshots that we've just seen. Some of that thermal imagery, I think, is is very powerful. So, uh, if you are the podcast listener who never normally goes to our Facebook page or our YouTube channel to look at the video, and that works a lot of the time, I think for this particular episode, treat yourself to the video as well because I think some of those images were, and also all of the, all of the the uh, the papers that you've you've highlighted there. I'll try I'll try and go th back through and I'll try and. Pull, pull the papers and I'll try and post them in the links. But I think if you're, yeah, if you're a podcast listener, come and listen to the video for sure. Or come and watch the video, I should say, sorry. Yes. No, so I think, I mean, that, that's a good note to wind up on. So look, thanks so much, Cynthia. Thanks so much, Alfred. You know, it's, it's really been good. It's, it's answered a few questions I had about what's going on in Malta. Um, Thank you for inviting us. No, Thank you for inviting us. For, Thank for you for your time. Who, for those that have joined late, um, if you come back to Facebook in about 10 minutes, the video should be there from the beginning. Um, it will be up on YouTube at some stage today. Depends if I go for a long run or not. It's whether I've got time to do it now or later. Um, and, the, and the podcast version will be there for everyone. So, look, thanks again, guys. Thanks, Alfred. Thanks, Ian. Thanks. And, uh, and maybe yeah, another... It's maybe good night, from another 25 percent increase in population in the next five years surely coming after this episode i might be i might be one of them I might be. <laughs> okay that's thanks. great thanks everyone